Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to City of Confidence TV. And today we have a very exceptional guest called Ernest Higa. I'm sure a lot of you know him as well. But I'm super excited because this is my first time interviewing you. And well, we have you. met um, six, seven years ago, I think, yes. on a nice wine dinner that... <laughs> yes, a lot of wine, that's for sure, yes. <laughs> it was very memorable and uh, very exceptional wine. So as a wine lover, I didn't know that you were going to a lot of dinners, yeah. but I'm sure this is all discovery every time on a different Yes, topic. well, it was a nice in environment that yeah. we had. Uh, I think it was uh, Kanetanaka. Yeah. And uh, so um, I've been there, you know, for more traditional mm -hmm. dinners, so that was a little bit different. Different, and, correct. And it's it. very, usually it's a ryokan style. That's right, yes. And how is it normally? Normally it's a, it's a Japanese rote with, okay. you know, a kaiseki. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, geishas and uh, okay. quite different, yes. Oh, so it was really like yeah. a different kind of pairing this time. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So for those who don't know Ernie, may I? Sure. Um, can you please introduce yourself to uh, our public? Okay. So I'm actually uh, a Japanese American. I was born in Hawaii. Um, and then from Hawaii, I went to elementary school in Geneva, Switzerland at Ecole Internationale. And then junior high school and high school here in Japan at the American School. Um, and then I went to um, college at the Warden Undergraduate School at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And a summer semester at Cambridge University in England. And then I got my MBA at Columbia in New York. Mm. Then came back to Japan. And uh, the reason why I came back to Japan is my father had some businesses. And he wanted me to join the family business. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for three years okay. with my siblings. And then my father thought that, you know, family business can be very difficult and sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, and he could see that this could be an issue. Uh, I, I, there are four, four of us, yeah. and uh, we're all working together. So he said, well, to resolve this, uh, the best thing is to have each child handle one business uh, on their own. And mm -hmm. so he had three businesses, mm -hmm. uh, but he had four children. Okay. And we all know three doesn't divide by four equally, and I was the youngest. Okay. So um, all of a sudden, I had to become an entrepreneur. That's how I started out. Wow. So that was not my intention. I, I, I planned to just join the family business and yeah. stay there. But, um, you know, I think uh, in hindsight, my father had a lot of wisdom because we were all able to um, work independently, mm -hmm. and we we're, you know, as a family, we had great relationships because we did not work together, actually. Mm. But the problem was, it was a little bit unfair in the beginning because I had, I had, two, brother, I had two brothers and one sister, mm -hmm. and they all got a business, and I didn't get one. So I had to start from zero. And so <laughs> I felt like a poor relative every time we got together. They all had business, and I, I was still trying to figure out uh -huh. you know, what I was going to do. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but so you, that had to, you had to do a business. I had to do a business, so that was the thing. So there's several challenges mm -hmm. because I said I was born in Hawaii, so I'm actually an American citizen. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came back to Japan, one of the first challenges was actually to learn Japanese. Because mm. although I was going to the American school in Japan, mm -hmm. you know, I, my main goal back then in high school was to have fun, and uh -huh. I, I didn't really <laughs> learn the language or the culture. Of course. And so I, um, I regretted that, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But when I came back, obviously, um, uh, the, the difficult thing, unlike yourself, Claire, where you have blonde hair and, and you look you know, different, I look Japanese. So when I couldn't speak Japanese uh -huh. and uh, I didn't know, you know all the protocols in Japan, then mm -hmm. you know, they assumed that I was retarded. <laughs> this is back then in you know, 1979 mm -hmm. when I started. So there were not a lot of Asians, you know, mm -hmm. who were not Japanese. If you were, if you looked Japanese, you, were, mm -hmm. you had to be Japanese. And so uh, the first challenge was if I was going to really uh, try to do business uh, in Japan uh, on my own, starting from scratch, uh, was to learn the language. But just as important uh, was to really understand the culture and understand the Japanese people. Mm -hmm. Uh, although I looked Japanese, uh, you know, that was a big challenge for me, and uh, that actually made it more of a challenge. And so I thought, well, I will give it five years here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was still young then. And if it didn't work out, I would go back to the United States. And, uh, you know, business is challenging enough in your own language and your own culture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and back in the, the, the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, when I started in Japan, there was not even a word for entrepreneur uh, in Japan. 
The closest word, I think, was like datsasara, which was a negative yes. connotation. That means you worked for a company, you couldn't make, make it, or you left and you started a ramen shop or you know, some kind of yakitori shop. And yeah. it, it didn't have a very positive mm -hmm. image because what happened, the best and brightest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, went either first into government or into large corporations. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and that's where you went. And if you, you know, couldn't make it, then mm -hmm. you, you tried to do your own little business. Mm -hmm. And back in the 70s and the 80s, of course, it was really for large corporations. Mm -hmm. There was not that much entrepreneurship. Absolutely. And that meant that banks would not lend to you. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're young and you're not Japanese, that and also... How old were you then? Uh, at 26. Wow. So, uh, so I figured several things. Number one, I, if I didn't learn Japanese quickly and the culture, I would go bankrupt. So that was kind of a, an incentive. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it, um, the, the other thing was uh, really figuring out what I should do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I realized that, you know, it would take me a long time to, to be Japanese, to, mm -hmm. to really be like a Japanese, mm -hmm. although you know, I tried my best to learn the language and the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I finally figured out the best thing I could do was to leverage my own strengths mm. as a person that I had. And, um, and obviously know, know my weaknesses as well. <laughs> and so uh, uh, then it became apparent that mm -hmm. uh, the major strength I had mm -hmm. is I knew more about, say, the United States, mm -hmm. where I spent part of my life than mm -hmm. most Japanese. Mm -hmm and more about Japan than most uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. And so I thought leveraging my bicultural background, all that was in Europe as well, but primarily the US and Japan, and uh, would probably be um, the first step in figuring out what I should do. Mm. And uh, you know, back then, you know, uh, Japan was perceived to be a very difficult market for mm -hmm. American companies to succeed in, mm -hmm. even for large corporations. Mm -hmm. And it was dominated primarily by, by local Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought that, well, you know, the Japanese companies, when they went to the U.S. market, uh, if they had a good product and a good mm -hmm. price, you mm -hmm. know, they could sell and actually succeed. And, mm -hmm. and many were. The reverse was not quite true back mm -hmm. then. Um, and that's because Japan was a different market. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that I could leverage my upbringing, my my so-called, you know, what I thought perceived as my strength mm -hmm. by bringing U.S. products to Japan and adapting for the Japanese market mm. and, <clears throat> and, and uh, the Japanese uh, consumer, the Japanese customer. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this is a niche, you know, that maybe I, I could do better than most Japanese mm -hmm. or than most Americans because, mm -hmm. you know, I had, uh, as I said, uh, I was brought up in, in both cultures, Absolutely. although I, l I had to learn the Japanese culture and language, but um, yeah. as I said, I learned it pretty quickly because I, I, I thought I had to. But yeah. in my, I guess because I'm of Japanese heritage, there was some of that in my mm -hmm. upbringing anyway, so mm -hmm. I had some sensitivity to the Japanese mm -hmm. culture and mm -hmm. some understanding, mm. which I enhanced by actually living here. And um, so the first business I got involved in was really in the lumber business. And at that time, it was 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when they had the U.S.-Japan uh, mm -hmm. kind of trade wars, yeah. and so um, the uh, the concern of the largest um, at that time uh, end user of lumber was a, a prefabricated home builder called Misawa Homes, mm -hmm. and um, they were concerned because normally the lumber business was done by these major trading firms mm -hmm. that would import logs, sell to Japanese sawmills, but then and then the sawmills were cut up for the Japanese sizes specifications, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, quality requirements, but uh, the U.S. said that they wanted to value added done in the United States, so to have the logs cut in U.S. sawmills, mm -hmm. uh, and and so there was this issue because the U.S. sawmills could not cut the Japanese sizes and specifications, mm. and uh, so for Misawa Homes, if they stopped the export of logs mm -hmm. to Japan and they had to buy the finished lumber, they would be in trouble because they couldn't get their, their size and specification cut. Mm. And that was their whole business. Mm -hmm. So um, back then, you know, they had these business groupings. And uh, well, then their group, uh, the Tokai Bank Group, of course, was a big Sogo Shosha. Mm -hmm. But the common wisdom is you couldn't do that mm -hmm. because the U.S. Samus couldn't cut mm -hmm. the, the very specific size and specifications. And, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it was not... Um, really something that they could get involved in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're very big. They, they deal with, you know, 
huge volumes of logs and also what they call baby squares, very uh, simple mm -hmm. kind of cut lumber, but not as very, very specific sizes that Misao Homes required. So uh, through um, a director of Misao Homes that I, that I, I knew, um, I had a chance to meet with uh, the president of Misao, his mm -hmm. name was uh, Chioji Misao, mm -hmm. actually a very successful entrepreneur who developed uh, one of the largest uh, housing companies in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so he told me about his issue, and uh, you know, I said, well, okay, I know something about the U.S. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and something about Japan. Maybe I could resolve this thing, not knowing anything about mm. the lumber business. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like, you know, uh, it should be easy. Here was a customer, and you know, there's all these sawmills and lumber mm -hmm. coming from the U.S. But it wasn't, and it had to do with really kind of bridging the gap between mm -hmm. the U.S. and Japan in terms of the, the mentality, uh, the culture, and also that surround the business itself. Mm -hmm. And just to give an idea, not to get in too much detail, but um, in the U.S., for example, the quality of lumber is determined by structural strength. The higher the structural strength, the higher okay. the, the quality. It's very practical, so the house doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. In Japan, it's a visual grade, so it has to look good, which is a higher mm -hmm. quality than structural strength. And it has to have you know, very small knots and you know, very square uh, wood. And of course, the sizes were um, different metric sizes than what they cut in the U.S. And uh, the size tolerances, particularly for prefabricated manufacturers, like plus minus one millimeter, which is, um, from the U.S. perspective, was really um, very difficult mm. for them to uh, maintain those tolerances. So this was a challenge. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I was very lucky. I happened to finally work with a sawmill. And they had to actually renovate the sawmill to adapt for um, uh, first of all, Misao Homes, and then I was, I was the first one to have these finished lumber cut uh, in a U.S. sawmill mm. for a Japanese uh, home builder. But if I may ask, why did you choose that industry to start off? So the thing was U.S. Japan, as I said, yeah. and then beyond that, I really had no idea. So mm. it was just by chance mm. and uh, through a meeting and, and finding that there was a need for this, mm -hmm. and I thought that, well, you know, it, although it's something that these large trading firms could not mm -hmm. do, maybe that was an opportunity for an entrepreneur to mm -hmm. get involved and mm -hmm. to, to really try to, it was a matter of, of uh, communication, bridging the gap, mm -hmm. really trying to uh, work with uh, mm -hmm. U.S. companies to get them to understand the needs mm -hmm. of, of the Japanese uh, home builders and mm -hmm. the sizes. Um, it was a lot more difficult than I expected, mm -hmm. but uh, through that I ended up then uh, developing that even further and started to sell all the major home builders. Wow. And, uh, and then I um, then had d developed uh, lumber distribution centers throughout Japan because mm -hmm. I had to make my own because I was um, not working with the trading firms. And then I had to develop branch offices for quality control in Portland and Seattle. And then we actually uh, had operations in Northern Europe. And then I also integrated vertically backwards. I bought a sawmill in Canada and then we had uh, lumber cutting rice. But at one time, so I was one of the largest uh, importers of finished lumber into Japan mm. in this niche market. Mm. Uh, but as time goes along, then the, a lot of the large trading firms started to go into that segment because it actually grew a lot more. Mm -hmm. the, the reason behind that is a whole other story, but um, it, it, it grew uh, to beyond the niche, and mm -hmm. so then it was time to uh, get out of it. It became very competitive. Okay. And then I got involved in the neurosurgical uh, brain implant business. Uh, which really? is yes, wow. um, that's completely different. Quite different, but same logic actually. Uh, you know, I, again through chance and through some meeting people. Mm -hmm. um, the um, this is a little bit of a different issue in, in the lumber business. It's a matter mm -hmm. of understanding quality requirements mm -hmm. or you know sizes and, mm -hmm. and, and working on those things. In the medical device business, mm -hmm. um, it's a very regulated business, mm -hmm. so they have. Um, just to import the products, you need to have a medical import license. Mm. And to get that, you need to have medical labs, medical technicians, and, uh, and then each product has to be approved. So it's mm. a lot of upfront investment. Mm -hmm. And then you can see if you can sell it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. of course. So um, I, I worked with this, um, actually, uh, this person in Santa Barbara. And he had uh, developed the largest uh, uh, kind of uh, neurosurgical brain implants for a very specific um, kind of uh, surgery called well, mm -hmm. uh, shunt shunting for hydrocephalic patients. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he sold his business to a very lo a large uh, uh, medical company. Mm -hmm. And so 
he had a non-compete clause, and when that was over, he decided to make a better product. And so that was uh, the person I met. Mm. And so I figured if he made a very successful product before, this, this product could also maybe, he said it's better. So I, I thought, well, okay, this, this would be uh, another great business to get into. Mm -hmm. um, that was different than the lumber business. But again, it required some understanding of Japan. So I made all this investment. I, you know, I got the medical licenses, lab facilities, sure lab technicians. Easy, I yeah, know. I brought it in. I went to neurosurgeons and could not sell it. <laughs> and, so, and, uh, and so, you know, they said it had to be a different shape. Uh, it had to have different kind of uh, texture and so mm -hmm. on. So I went back uh, to the manufacturers and said, you know, um, I made all this investment. Of course. And could not sell. Mm -hmm. And they said it has to be different. And mm -hmm. they said, but Ernie, you know, brains are the same in Japan as in the United States. And, you know, they must be wrong. I said, <laughs> you know. Um, well, maybe, you know, they said, well, you don't really know this business because it's new for you. Mm -hmm. you know, you're doing the lumber business, but uh, this is different. So um, I tried, and, mm -hmm. and it just was not working. So mm -hmm. I finally convinced them um, that they should develop uh, different shapes and different mm -hmm. uh, textures in this. Very, it's, a, it's, it's a very kind of niche area, again, mm -hmm. uh, in neurosurgery. Um, for the Japanese market, mm -hmm. and we ended up with the second largest market share in Japan. Mm -hmm. And wow. what they said is true, brains are the same. Mm -hmm. But the, the neurosurgeons had a different approach to the surgery, mm -hmm. and so they wanted a different shape and so on. And for them, actually, then the U.S. company took some of those ideas, and they actually then changed their products, mm -hmm. and, and they ended up uh, actually growing bigger because of some of the ideas from Japan. Okay. So it was an exchange going from Japan to the U.S. to the mm -hmm. manufacturer, and it, it was, so it was mutual. And uh, that, that was my second business, and then, I, and then I sold that business. That was a very profitable business because um, this is a business where it, it's not a matter of price mm -hmm. um, or, uh, or marketing, really. Mm -hmm. It's a very technical area. It's a, it, we had a, a very good product, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it, it was continuous uh, product development in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the U.S. company is very good at, at always coming up with new products for the, uh, surrounding the area of hydrocephalic patients and uh, uh, brain implants and mm -hmm. so on. And and did what, what, you, what you actually developed, was it in any relation to what you have learned in the past? So again, it was um, understanding that the Japanese market is different. Mm -hmm and getting the U.S. manufacturer to adapt for, for those differences, like mm -hmm. in the sawmill mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. That was the, the, the similar thing. Outside mm -hmm. of that, it's quite different. But, uh, you know, I'm not a, a lumber guy, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not a medical person. Mm -hmm. But, again, my whole thing was, you know, leveraging my ability to communicate and, and my the strength the of, uh, yeah, this, 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 that's, that's mm -hmm. the, the kind of the common element. Mm -hmm. So, again, I decided to try the same thing, and I uh, was, got involved with the, I brought Domino's Pizza to Japan. Yeah, what's your uh, legendary for? But that's <laughs> like a completely different area. Again. Yeah, so this is my third business. Wow. And um, you know, at that time, so this is in uh, 1984 when mm -hmm. I started to think about uh, Donald's Pizza. They had just—I'd never heard of Donald's Pizza, by the way. Okay. But in 1984, the the founder of Donald's Pizza mm -hmm. had just bought the Detroit Tigers, uh, okay. uh, this um, Major League Baseball team, for a record at th in those days, 53 million dollars. Mm -hmm. And it said that, you know, I read this article, it said that, you know, he did this um, by delivering pizza. I said, mm -hmm. oh, wow, <laughs> I've never, never heard of this. Um, on the other hand, pizza was not so popular in Japan at that time. Okay. Uh, yeah, Shakey's was here with a, a large uh, company and Pizza Hut, mm -hmm. and they were not succeeding. Mm. On the other hand, McDonald's was doing well and KFC was doing well. So, you know, the common wisdom back then was that Japanese people did not like pizza. And... Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, having said that, this is an interesting article, and I had a chance to, to meet with him. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, he, uh, when I was going to the U.S., uh, he said to meet him um, in, in Detroit at, at Tiger Stadium. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a great neighborhood, but anyway, <laughs> I was waiting there, and I assumed that he would come and pick me up in his you know, a car or something. Mm -hmm. But while I was waiting there, all of a sudden I saw this helicopter with Donald's mm. Pizza logo land, and, and mm. I said, wow, this is, this is interesting. And, wow. and uh, so he flew me in his helicopter to Ann Arbor, where their head office is, outside mm -hmm. of uh, Detroit. And, um, and there, you know, he showed me his classic car collection, 300 <laughs> classic cars. Wow. Um, you know, like he had a Bugatti Royale, which cost like $50 million, a couple of Duesenbergs cost a couple million dollars. And he said, this is all from the pizza business. <laughs> so I said, oh. 
and uh, and then he um, his uh, head office was based upon Frank Lloyd Wright, which mm -hmm. was he was a big fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, and mm -hmm. he had several Frank Lloyd Wright houses mm -hmm. reassembled around the head office, and he also had the largest. Uh, um, collection of Frank Lloyd Wright artifacts, you know, window sills, furniture, wow. and so on. And he said, Ernie, I did this with all the pizza business. And he had a private island, and he had private jets, and it was all from the pizza business. So then I said, oh, this pizza business must be interesting. So, you know, that got my interest. But just yeah. when I went back to Japan, you know, I realized that, you know, pizza was not really um, that popular. Yeah. As I mentioned, there's, there's two chains that had come with very large companies, and mm -hmm. they were not succeeding. M may I ask why weren't they not succeeding? At so that, that was my next question. Why weren't they succeeding? Because I wanted to do this thing. It was very exciting. You know, I, I saw you know this this you know incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and he owned it 100 percent. It was a private company. Wow. And uh, he was at that time in his 40s. But all the rest of the top management, with the average age is 27. So a very young company, and they're partying the whole time and yet being very successful. So I said, you know, that that's something I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. um, but when I came back to Japan. Obviously, it was going to be an investment, and I needed to, you know, know why it was not so successful, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did some market research, mm -hmm. and um, several things came up. But uh, long story short, they said that uh, Japanese people just didn't like uh, pizza because they didn't like cheese, uh, natural cheese. And, and the statistic behind that was the per capita consumption on an annual basis of natural cheese in Japan is less mm -hmm. than one kilogram, whereas wow. in the U.S. it's like 11 or 12. And this is in the 1980s. Mm. And in Europe, it could be like 20, 21 kilograms, yeah, a lot of cheese. So if they didn't like, in Japan, if the Japanese did not like natural cheese, they wouldn't like pizza. The other thing is, it's amazing because Italian food is so popular now. Mm -hmm. But this is in the 80s. Actually, French food was very popular then. Mm -hmm. But tomato sauce and cheese, it was not really, um, there are very few Italian restaurants. Mm. And it was just not popular at all. And so pizza was really not something that they thought would, would succeed. Um, and so that was disappointing. But the thing about Domino's was that it was a delivery pizza. Mm. And the, the chains that came to Japan were eaten. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you know, maybe this delivery concept, you know, would be a point of differentiation and make it successful. So Pizza Hut at first was not delivery? Not delivery, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were wow. originally an Eden store. They eventually started to copy mm -hmm. the Domino's model later on. And um, so. Uh, I thought, okay, so is this a point of difference? So, I, you know, I, again, through the market research, I said, well, you know, Japan traditionally had demai. They deliver sushi, they deliver, you know, soba, they deliver everything. So delivery is no big deal, <laughs> nothing new. You know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, no one likes pizza and delivery is nothing new. And in the U.S., however, you know, outside of like New York and Philadelphia, mm -hmm. delivery of food was very novel. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why Domino's grew so, so, so much in the United States. But Japan, everything was delivered. So that was kind of disappointing, but I did remember all those you know, great toys that Tom Monahan, who founded Donald's, had in the US. And I said, you know, well, you know, maybe if I, if I could you know, figure out again how I can adapt Donald's for the Japanese market, mm -hmm. uh, maybe this, this could work. Of and so, um, so I, I started saying, okay, how, how can we adapt it? And, and you know, there's a whole bunch of things, there are differences, but maybe. Um, if I already kind of summarize it, there, there's several differences between the consumer, mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese consumer and, 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 and the U.S. consumer. And one of it is that, um, uh, you know, first of all, because pizza was, mm -hmm. you know, not so common and actually not so popular back then, mm -hmm. you know, I, I um, thought that we should use familiar toppings. So, okay. you know, I used, besides the pepperoni and Italian sausage, by the way, I was the first one to bring that into Japan. It mm -hmm. didn't exist, but uh, I used- Pepperoni? Yeah, really, <laughs> yeah, it didn't exist. And, and there's a whole story, oh, another story behind that, because uh, it had certain ingredients that were not allowed, oh, uh, and okay. so on. So you had to yeah. change everything. But anyway, I went through all of that process, but I also started to do teriyaki chicken and squid and all mm -hmm. these kind of things that Japanese would, would know. Yeah. And then they, they might eat the pizza. So. That was, but that was um, more of a, an obvious thing that I had to have, things that appealed to the Japanese mm -hmm. consumer on, as topping. Uh, but in the U.S., you know, they stuck mm -hmm. to only 12 toppings mm -hmm. and one drink at that time, Coke. And they built, you know, was, uh, uh, about a five, six billion dollar a year corporation when I was mm -hmm. dealing with them. Um, but they kept things very simple. But for Japan, um, the consumer here lacks variety. Mm -hmm. And they are what you call akipoi. They get tired of things. So 
we ended up with 35 different toppings and seasonal menus every three months, mm -hmm. and then more than just one drink, and then a lot of side dishes. And this is the antithesis of mm -hmm. the Domino's concept, and I had to get the owner to, to you know, understand Japan is different. Mm -mm -mm. They course. like variety. Of course. Having said that, you know, the fast food business is all about keeping it simple, because mm -hmm. you deal with part-timers and they change over. Yeah. So the, the key was trying to keep the operation simple, but still giving variety to the customer, because mm -hmm. they wanted variety. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one very big difference. And even today, you know, I've since sold the Domino's Pizza business, but it's all kinds of varieties on it. On, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's very important. So look, like, look at Coca-Cola mm -hmm. in the States, you know, since 1800s, basically a Coke company and mm -hmm. maybe some Fanta drinks. But in Japan, I think they introduced 70 or 80 new drinks every year, you know, and, you know, they, and canned coffee is actually the best seller, not even Coke, yeah. you know, and then it's tea. And uh, so they're, they're a beverage company here. Mm -hmm. So they had to adapt, but also it's continuous product development. Mm -hmm. So that was a, that's a difference for the consumer here. They, mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are really um, like variety. Mm -hmm. The other thing is uh, higher quality, mm -hmm. not volume. So in, in the U.S., if, if you want to increase customer satisfaction, you supersize it. Of course. In the fast food business. <laughs> So in Japan, it's not super yeah. Actually, quantity doesn't, doesn't really no, yeah. drive the needle for the consumer, yeah. so it's about quality. Mm -hmm. So we use a higher quality cheese, higher quality toppings, all this kind of stuff, uh, which is um, a different approach mm -hmm. to, but, you know, to get to uh, the consumer here in Japan mm -hmm. to like pizza. Mm -hmm. And the third thing really was on, on service. You know, in the States, they say, you know, the customer is king. Mm -hmm. But I've never been to a fast food place where I felt like a king. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so true. But in Japan, so kyakusama, kamisama. Yeah. The customer is God. Yeah. Much a high level than, mm -hmm. than, you know, king. And they actually serve you like uh, kamisama mm -hmm. here, wherever you are, even in fast food. Mm. And so we had to change the manuals for, you know, how, how our mm -hmm. drivers would, you know, uh, deliver the pizza and so on. And I think the other thing is say made it better or presentation. Yeah. Yeah. You eat with your eyes. And in the US if it tastes good, that's all. But in Japan we actually had to make manuals to show, you know, how the toppings could be pretty and use different colors mm -hmm. uh, uh, toppings so that it, it looked uh, mm -hmm. nice and so on. Um, even though we we're fast food. That was still a very critical element. So those mm -hmm. are some of the differences. You mm -hmm. know, I can go on and on, but um, those are some of the things that uh, we did to um, uh, adapt for the Japanese market. So again, I'm not a, a food guy, mm -hmm. but I realize that there is a, a cultural gap. The biggest issue when you deal with a company like Donald's Pizza, they're so successful mm -hmm. with a certain formula, mm -hmm. and they don't want to change that. Mm -hmm. And they and they're also global, and they well, I end up helping them go global. Mm -hmm. But they um, they want to stick with that formula because that's what franchise is all about, mm -hmm. not to go off on your own. Mm -hmm. But for the Japanese market, you the consumer is different. I finally told you know. Tom Monahan is the founder of Dama, said, you know, I, you have to adapt. You have to think global, but act local. Yep. And, uh, but, the, you know, in the franchising business, I, I, add my own, I added my own words, and don't go too native. They're always concerned about you going too native, then there's no point in tying up with the U.S. company. Mm -hmm. But it's a moving target. Mm -hmm. You know, what's global, what's local, mm -hmm. and going too native on something mm -hmm. like this in the franchise business. Because mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you really go too native, then, you know, it, it changes the whole branding of mm -hmm. it and so on. So that was a. Uh, I do yeah. have a key question. Though. Okay. How did you differentiate yourself from Pizza Hut? Well, at that time, so they were, uh, it was an Eden uh, restaurant, and uh, they were only serving uh, primarily um, U.S. type toppings. Okay. So pepperoni town sauce, I said, did not exist. They were using salami and so mm -hmm. on. And um, they, um, they brought the U.S. concept as is, so it was a lower price and lower quality. Mm. And um, you know, it, if when I thought about that whole thing, mm -hmm. I said in the U.S., pizza is basically uh, a mass it's for a mass food, mm. so it's 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 price very you know low, mm -hmm. so it's for uh, you know like college students and and, and uh, you know mass food, but the frequency is very high of pizza mm -hmm. in the U.S. So even though you have a lower price, you know. They, people might order like three times a week. Mm -hmm. But because pizza in Japan, as I said earlier, was not very popular, mm -hmm. if you price very low and your frequency is low, mm -hmm. that'd be tough because the mass food here is like a bowl of noodles. They might have ramen three times a week, so you can price it low. Mm -hmm. But if they have pizza, say, once or twice a year, it, it's a tough 
tells us to do. So part of the thing was when I increased the quality, I also increased the pricing. Mm -hmm. I made sure I had enough profit. Mm -hmm. And I, and I made it more of an upscale. I actually, so this is a, another adaptation, but I repositioned uh, Domino's Pizza here, mm -hmm. unlike the U.S., in more upscale mm -hmm. um, and uh, a kind of like a higher image, mm -hmm. but accordingly, you know, higher quality, but also higher price. Mm -hmm. So that to justify the, the, the lower frequency. Of course. And, and, it, and it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember one of the first, you know, menus I made this before I got involved with internet ordering because I was the first into internet ordering before the U.S. actually. But was with uh, uh, all these people in tuxedo and long dresses, mm -hmm. at, and I did it at the Mitsui Club, mm -hmm. and they're eating pizza <laughs> to show that this is their <laughs> high Fantastic. end, you know. And that was the imagery, and, and that was kind of the, the thinking there. Yeah. Uh, so um, that that was quite different than pizza. than than uh, Pizza Hut here mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so my pricing is quite different, but so was everything else, mm -hmm. yeah, to justify that. So um, just for our viewers, just to have a, a difference in, in yen, uh, Pizza mm -hmm. Hut is approximately how much, and Domino's how Well, much? now they, they've all kind of copied yeah. Domino's, so, yeah. you know, the average pizza here is maybe about 2,500 yen, mm -hmm. uh, which is, Brand size. So, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whereas in the states, maybe it's about five dollars or five hundred yen, so it's quite different, huge, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, That's well, one of we have to reposition. Every time. <laughs> well, but the, you see, so we give quality, and you know, and, and there's a, there's a lot that goes with it. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Actually, uh, you know, I, I can make a whole another story because I ended up buying Donald's Pizza Hawaii, and okay. I can tell you the difference in Hawaii and Japan again. It's so different, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'll just tell you one story. We always do customer service, mm. and so um, in, in Hawaii, I remember I got this customer service, and it said. You guys are so fantastic. Mm -hmm. I actually got the pizza I ordered an exact change. I'm saying, mm -hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's, you know, that's normal. Um, but in Japan, when I got the customer service, they said, your driver is not bow low enough. You guys are terrible. So, you know, the, the, the expectation of the customer mm -hmm. is, is so different. It's different. But the other shock was, uh, you know, in Hawaii, I went to my stores there and I had all the stores on all the islands. And there are no drivers that day. And I said, what happened? I said, oh, Mr. Higa, surf stop. I said, so what? So, you know, everyone went, went surfing. <laughs> you, know, we have to, you know, we have to work here and deliver, you know, the pizza to our customers. I, I learned a few things, different culture. Mm -hmm. I'm from Hawaii, mm -hmm. but I, these are things that I started my business in Japan. And so it was a culture shock for me to do business <laughs> in Hawaii. Uh, but that was a whole other thing. So yeah. you centered your business, you expanded the franchise in Japan, but also to... So I, I, I had all the rights for Japan, okay. and I actually owned and operated all the stores here. Mm -hmm. And in the process, uh, so this is during the 80s, mm -hmm. actually um, the business was going well, mm -hmm. but the biggest issue for me was getting people mm. because of the labor shortage. And so I was figuring, how can I attract people? Mm -hmm. Because the service industry, industry was not the most attractive industry mm -hmm. to get people, and especially during the bubble economy, you know, mm -hmm. everyone was wanted people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, they said, if you had a formula team, you could get people. So I actually had a formula team, race queens, really? spent a lot of money, and I couldn't get people. <laughs> so I said, oh my gosh. And I, knew, I didn't even like racing, by the way, but I got all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, you know, and, it was, and it was a lot of money. And you, 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 we used a, a large um, advertising firm because you have to also promote this, not mm -hmm. only have the, uh, the race team. We actually had three different race teams at mm. one time. And it didn't work. But I thought, well, you know, the Japanese people really love Hawaii. Mm -hmm. That's their number one destination. Mm -hmm. So if I bought Domino's Hawaii, Mm. And all I had to do was break even there. I could have exchange programs mm. and, you know, have part-time from here to go to Hawaii and uh, full-time people to attract people to, to Japan because mm -hmm. this is where, you know, this is the big market mm -hmm. and this is where we could make more money. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real uh, reason to, to buy Hawaii. Okay. The downside was every time I went to Hawaii, I ended up working. <laughs> and I, I, so I, yeah, that was not such a good idea, uh, having a company in Hawaii. But anyway, um, that was that was. A r so rationale. that was kind of the uh, exception of the owner, basically. Uh, he, basically, you bought it. Yes, I, I bought it from uh, Tom on end. He, nice. Yeah, it was, it was uh, uh, owned by the corporation mm, there, correct. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So among all the different businesses that, and so apart from Domino's, you also do other yes. businesses of import. Uh, so yeah, so well, several things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, it, it's good and it's bad because you mm -hmm. keep on taking on 
more and more challenges. Yeah. And, and each one is, of course, a challenge. Yeah. And there's no guarantee that they'll all succeed. Yeah. But um, because I had did Domino's and, and it, it was, went quite well, and I sold Domino's, I was fine. Mm -hmm. I was contacted by the American Embassy, uh, uh, by the Wendy's people. Mm. And they had been in Japan twice before with large corporations and had failed. And so they said, you know, Ernie, would you like to do Wendy's? I said, no, mm -hmm. they failed <laughs> twice before, of course not. Uh, but I'm willing to give some free advice because okay. I do have some experience. Yeah. And I'm willing to meet with them. Oh, that's great. So I met with them and I said, okay, went through the same story. You have to adapt for Japan, you know, think global, act local, mm -hmm. don't go to native. And uh, I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I said, yeah, yeah. You want to do it? I said, no, I don't want to do it. And I said, are you free for dinner? Said, oh, yes, I'm free for dinner. And uh, as we're having dinner and I was on my third vodka tonic, I started to say, you know, this is an interesting challenge. I mean, these large corporations failed with mm -hmm. Wendy's reform. And, you know, so <laughs> you start to think, you know, okay, well, maybe, maybe I can do it again, mm -hmm. you know, with, you know, adaptation. Mm -hmm. And then he said that they'd go with, you know, my ideas and so on. And so um, I said, you know, I think I will do this uh, Wendy's thing. And actually, as vodka we started to, helped. well, yeah, this is <laughs> I'll never have three vodka tonics again. It, it was a, yeah, it, 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 it <laughs> was a challenge. It was a challenge. Um, and I actually, as we're negotiating this mm -hmm. thing, um, we were actually, the final negotiation was during March 11th when they had the, you know, the wow. Daishinsai up, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the great disaster. And I'm wondering, why am I doing a new business when, you know, it seems like the whole world is coming to an end here in Japan with the Fukushima uh, disaster. But I went ahead and signed it. And, uh, um, and then we started to do it. Then the, the president changed and uh, of Wendy's in the U.S., mm -hmm. these large uh, public corporations mm -hmm. uh, tend to do that. And so we signed the contract, but all those adaptations I was talking about, all of a sudden, you know, they, were, they couldn't agree to that. It had to be the same as U.S. and so mm -hmm. on. And I knew this would not work, mm -hmm. but I was committed already to open some stores. And they had to be big stores, which I knew wouldn't work, and big footprints, big kitchen, all these things that uh, were very difficult. And so, but I said, okay. You know, let's do it, and I'll show you that you know this is not going to work. And I did it, and it didn't work. And so we were suffering. And then uh, I realized, unlike Domino's, where we could be in the back streets mm -hmm. and small footprints, uh, and because you know f f small footprint store, because we delivered. Mm -hmm. Here we had to have the what they call the A location, mm -hmm. high traffic location, mm -hmm. in front of a train station, or you know, on the Ginza. Mm -hmm. And um, even though we've been in deflation for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. To get a good location, everyone wants a good location in retail, mm -hmm. uh, so it's difficult. And if you do, it doesn't pay with hamburgers. You know, if you're selling Louis Vuitton or you know, Gucci, of you course. have the margins. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a challenge to get a good location mm -hmm. and then have it pay. And of course, the chain concept is all about um, scale. You have mm -hmm. to get the critical mass. Of course. So it's like a chicken and the egg. If you can't get the location, you can't get the critical mass. And so you know, I said, you know, that third vodka tonic was really a bad idea. Um, should not have done that. And I was trying to figure out my way around. And then um, I think they, uh, I, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, again, through, uh, one of my, through my friendships and so on, I, I knew people at Suntory. Mm -hmm. And Suntory had, had a hamburger chain for over 40 years called First Kitchen. Um, but it's a decimal point for them, and mm -hmm. it was not growing for mm -hmm. them. They're, as you know, big in the beverage business and the alcohol business. And so um, you know, I had a chance to talk with um, the, the owner of Suntory, who I've known for many years. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had this business. I was doing Wendy's. And he said, well, let's, let's try an experiment, try to work together. And uh, let's see if we can do. And this is really going local. But I said, mm -hmm. let's do a test of Wendy's and First Kitchen, called Wendy's First Kitchen, and mm -hmm. take the best products of First Kitchen, because they've been localized, obviously, mm -hmm. for 40 years in Japan. Yeah. And we will bring the Wendy's global element to this thing. So there's a real global, local. And, uh, and they had stores in great locations, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so the problem was then to convince Wendy's that they had to do something different and really localize. I mean, this is, it's like this saying, you know, specialty. yeah, like do something like in Louis Vuitton, Ashida June or something, combining mm -hmm. two brands like that. And, and it's a difficult thing. But again, I said, you know, you have to think outside of the box. It's the third time around. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
they've been here before, it didn't work. And, you know, if this works, you know, this really is the way to get us to critical mass mm -hmm. and some good locations. So we did the Rapungi store, and the sales in deflation went up over 200% year-on-year sales. It was very high. Uh, so, oh, that's great. But it's Rapungi, which is a unique uh, location. As you know, it's very popular with mm -hmm. uh, foreign people and, yep. and you know, very lively mm -hmm. night, night uh, time area. So we, we took a more traditional mm -hmm. uh, location, the Ueno uh, station. And also, it went up very high. So we said, oh, this is working. Mm -hmm. So um, after a lot of negotiation, mm -hmm. both with Wendy's, and then uh, I, I also joined up with an investment firm, we bought out the first kitchen chain from Suntory. And, uh, and then we started to convert mm -hmm. Wendy's first kitchen. And um, so we, it, they had a hundred and half, 130 stores uh, nationwide. And mm -hmm. so we, we have been doing that. So that is one of the things I'm now still doing. I'm, I'm the In parallel. Right now, yes. And then I also import food. And we, we do some the supply chain. We sell to a mm -hmm. lot of the major chains, including mm -hmm. Wendy's <laughs> uh, First Kitchen. Uh, so we import products. Uh, and again, you know, here, the products have the different ingredients, different mm -hmm. packaging. Uh, we sell to um, chains, mm -hmm. uh, to convenience stores, mm -hmm. to food manufacturers. But um, there are certain uh, requirements by the FDA here for mm -hmm. uh, ingredients and also packaging by the consumers and so on. So there's always some uh, adaptation necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so, you know, when is a big a adaptation for Japan, food's you know, the same thing. We import food from uh, around the world. Uh, U.S., South America, some from Europe. And so you import food, you don't make food locally? No. 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 And uh, so, um, but we all often have the, the manufacturer make for us, mm -hmm. especially because, because of the various different requirements mm -hmm. for Japan. Mm -hmm. So in every case, uh, you know, I'm involved, or I've been leveraging my understanding of both cultures mm -hmm. and, and bridging that and, and, and working very closely with mm -hmm. you know, the the U.S. or the foreign manufacturer or, or you know, the master franchise or to adapt for the Japanese mm -hmm. marketplace. And uh, that's really what my business is. Okay. So yeah. right after the trailer, we'll move to the topic of confidence. <laughs> And we're back with Ernest Higa. So, Ernie, let's. So, you were explaining about the fact that you f basically fusioned uh, two brands together Correct. to adapt to the local market. Yes. And um, so now you have how many stores? So, we have over 130 stores. Okay. What it did is it, it gave us uh, critical mass mm -hmm. uh, and these um, very strategic, uh, great locations mm -hmm. at legacy rents. But one of the things that came along with, um, which is very important, it's kind of an off balance sheet asset. It came mm -hmm. along with 3,300 people. And as you know, there's a labor shortage, mm -hmm. and it's particularly in the service industry. Mm -hmm. Even with the economy mm -hmm. uh, uh, being so bad, less so now with uh, the corona situation, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it's a very labor intensive uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And they're already trained in the, in, in the service business. All we have to do is retrain them for the Wendy's uh, mm -hmm. products and so on. So mm -hmm. that was really uh, also very helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, um, so far, you know, knock on wood, it seems to be working. So, yes. So you're moving these two businesses? So, we, so we're, we've been converting. Uh, we, we've uh, the first kitchen store is to Wendy's first kitchen. Okay. Of course, um, certainly we've kind of slowed that down now, but we've always tried to add technology and then mm -hmm. something to it. So we, we introduced touchscreen kiosks mm -hmm. uh, early on and also mobile ordering. Mm -hmm. And we're working on various new um, you know, tech initiatives. For example, when I did Domino's Pizza, mm -hmm. initially it was you know, distributing flyers and taking the order by phone. But mm -hmm. I was the first one to do internet ordering, mm. uh, even before the US. Mm -hmm. uh, that time they told me, don't waste your time money and effort mm. on the internet. And, um, but you know, I think technology is, is very important, even mm -hmm. for the fast food business. Mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of an aside, but I remember um, 
when uh, NTT Data, actually mm -hmm. the first one to come with an internet mall. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I said, wow, okay, well, Domino's gonna be the first one to have an internet store. Mm -hmm. And so we were on that, and uh, unfortunately, so we're the virtual store and this virtual mall, mm -hmm. but sales and profits was also virtual, and they closed it down. Mm -hmm. It was too early. This was before Rock 10. So mm -hmm. actually, they're, they're, they had the first mall before Rock 10. Wow. But I continued with that, and eventually, um, uh, the internet ordering business became very critical for Domino's. So mm -hmm. when I sold that, about 60% of our sales was through the internet. And probably it's more now. I was involved in developing the first app on mm -hmm. the iPhone for, for Domino's, mm -hmm. downloading here in Japan. And so um, going back to Wendy, so we're trying to do more technology, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but um, so if you go to our stores, you'll see it's a touch screen. And, mm -hmm. uh, and originally we're preparing for the Olympics. So mm -hmm. it was in English, Japanese, mm -hmm. Korean, and uh, Chinese. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, four different languages you, you can order and, and so on. You do also delivery? So we've tied up uh, with the, you know, the delivery companies mm -hmm. like Uber Eats and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so on for delivery, yes. Fantastic. And how is that going since Corona happened? Well, certainly that's grown. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and takeout has grown as well too. Mm -hmm. So we have been fortunate that, of course, there's some effect in our eat-in business, mm -hmm. but um, we're less affected than, say, other kinds of uh, restaurants. Fast mm -hmm. food tends to be, you know, uh, has not been as affected as, mm -hmm. as regular restaurants. You know. So moving maybe to the uh, topic of you personally. Okay. Um, so as this is also, uh, COC TV is also focusing on um, your mindset on basically the, build, the confidence that you've been, I believe, building from your first business to the businesses that you operate today. Mm -hmm. um, having two different cultures and also different uh, worldwide background, I believe that it's also working, I mean, you chose to work on the Japanese market. So yes. Sort of. Yes. Yeah, I mean, not by choice, but I ended up here and I, I thought <laughs> I'd give it a try, yes. So you, you choose the Japanese market but um, you also, from your, the experience you've shared with me, um, I do, I mean, anybody can understand that you're quite a challenger, and especially when, you know, in the case of Wendy's, fail twice, but you still want to try. Is that, I mean, that should be one of, I believe, from a, my perspective, um, also the root of a confidence that how do you think you got that earned and got that confidence within yourself? Well, first of all, when you're an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. uh, you have to do things that people say are difficult. I mean, <laughs> if you yeah. did something that everyone thought was great, then everyone would be doing it already. Of course. And a large company would be doing it. So invariably, you end up doing something that people say you shouldn't do. It's not going to work. It's mm -hmm. going to fail. And, uh, and that's how entrepreneurs start out. Yeah. Uh, they have to think outside of the box mm -hmm. and do something that it's just goes against common mm -hmm. wisdom. Um, but I think, um, of course, confidence is important, but I think really positive thinking mm -hmm. uh, is, um, is very critical mm -hmm. because you hit all the brick walls when, when you're an entrepreneur. Yep. Uh, and, um, and it's so easy when you hit a brick wall is to give up mm -hmm. and say, okay, you know, I can't do it, I'm done, it, it looks terrible, I had mm -hmm. a bad day. <laughs> You know, uh, maybe I just work for another uh, a regular mm -hmm. company. You know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so that's the challenge uh, of being an entrepreneur: yeah. is is when you hit a brick wall, to can you remain positive? Mm -hmm. And generally, when you hit a brick wall, and a lot of these things, you know, are, are like you know, you know, beyond our control. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, there's there's you know two ways to react to something. You know, either mm -hmm. positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And I can say acting negative never gets you there. Positive. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And if you really are a positive person, you, you have a challenge, you, you deal with it, maybe you can overcome it. Mm -hmm. So I think then you hit so many brick walls and you try to deal with it positively. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you train yourself to be a positive thinker. Mm -hmm. and I think that gives you maybe the confidence mm -hmm. um, you need to, to take on challenges. Because if you're not a positive um, thinker, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to be an entrepreneur. Uh, so what do you think, do you believe you had a sort of a route where you start thinking this way? Because, I mean, from what you mentioned, having, I don't know, having different brothers also all running different yes. corporations, 
you get, in my case, I have a twin mm. sister, I get compared all the time. Did, do you? Identical twin or? Um, not really, but yeah. we look alike oh, a I lot. Um, I didn't know that. Uh, she's a um, mm -hmm. twin, well, girl, twin. Mm. And uh, you get compared a lot. And uh, I think that having, being an entrepreneur, we're both entrepreneurs ourselves, but being an entrepreneur and plus being raised with Mm -hmm. you know siblings that are also entrepreneurs I don't know I, I don't know in detail the background of your yes. parents but um, sort of allocating one business for each and so then my, you my father was an entrepreneur first of all okay. so um, you know I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but I mm. think we we're all influenced by him of course and he also was always challenging things mm -hmm. uh, uh, at a very young age. He started out in his 20s. Mm -hmm. And now it's a common phrase, but actually back in those days it was very unique. He, his, his phrase was can do. And now, of course, everyone talks about can do, but actually mm -hmm. he, it's almost like he made up that phrase for me because he <laughs> said that a long time ago, but, mm -hmm. you know, because cannot do just, you know, the, yeah. that, you know there's, that, that doesn't lead anywhere. Yeah. And so he was a very positive thinker and uh, he was very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And I think it affected all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you talked about my siblings. My sister was mm -hmm. the second woman to take a company public here in Japan. Wow. So she became very entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and grew the business she got and, and, mm -hmm. and established herself. So, uh, uh, you know, um, yes, we all end up being, I think, uh, entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, because of, because I think of my father. We, it's not like we wanted to copy him, actually. Yeah. You know, it just somehow, I think, we were influenced uh, mm -hmm. maybe s as, we, as we grew up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you feel that it was part of uh, having also siblings and your, your parent uh, being entrepreneur, do you believe that that mindset of entrepreneur led you to also be more competitive? Well, um, I guess, you know, there's, there's some, since we all worked in separately, mm -hmm. uh, we weren't competing together in the same company, which I think was good. But there could have been some competition as siblings. But, uh, but beyond that, really, doing business in Japan, this is a competitive market. So, you know, if you want to survive in mm -hmm. this market, I mean, it is, for example, let's take the restaurant industry. I mm -hmm. mean, there's a restaurant on Every everywhere corner. you go, and not only horizontal, but vertically, yeah. you know, on every floor, you yeah. know, and, and they all have great service and mm -hmm. great food mm -hmm. and, and, and reasonable prices. So. Um, you, you take anything, car industry, mm -hmm. there are much more car companies here than there are in the U.S. Mm -hmm. has three, you know, over here mm -hmm. they, they have, you know, much more than that. Yeah. Every industry here mm -hmm. has more players mm -hmm. than other countries, and they're all good. Mm -hmm. And so one thing you learn when you do business here in Japan is you've got to be competitive because it's a very competitive market. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it's very unforgiving. You have to continue to be uh, I always have a competitive edge. Yeah. So what's your favorite, I mean, you know, you mentioned that when you go to Hawaii, you end up working. I think that comes also. Well, I sold that company, so now I don't <laughs> do that. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you do, I mean, you do always, uh, especially if you, you grew up also as a, an entrepreneur mindset, you do also have, uh, you know, it's difficult to put barriers and boundaries, of course. but. Um, what would you say your um, motivation is to constantly do better? Well, you know, so I've I, I, I thought about that, actually, you know, and um, I, I think that um, my own kind of conclusion to that is really everyone has a potential. Mm -hmm. And um, it, even if a big potential, if, if you don't achieve it, you know, you're probably very unhappy. Mm -hmm. If you have a small potential and you achieve that, I think you're very happy. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea is you know, to try to um, achieve my potential. Mm -hmm. The big problem with that is, so what is my potential? Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to my earlier statement is to understand your own self, your own strengths, your own mm -hmm. weaknesses. Mm -hmm. and, and your own strengths is actually determines your potential. Mm -hmm. So for example, I know I could never be a basketball player. player. I'm too short. That's outside of my potential. Or a ballerina. I'm not a woman. So. That defines, you know, what mm -hmm. I can do, what I cannot do. There, mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things that are way outside of my potential. Mm -hmm. But within, it, within this, what could be my potential, mm -hmm. it, it really de is determined by my own personal strengths. Mm -hmm. and, and, and am I leveraging that to 
to the in, as much as possible mm -hmm. to to achieve that potential. Mm -hmm. The closer you do, I think that's where you know um, you feel fulfilled or you know, self-actualized. I don't know the right word, but I think that's kind of um, what what drives me is to to try to achieve the potential I have, mm -hmm. and and. The reverse of that is if I had this great potential and I was doing nothing, I think that the, this, the difference between my potential and where, where I am would, would be, uh, you know, uh, I would be very unhappy. Mm. Yeah. So if um, one of our viewers actually is, you know, looking at you and they're just wondering how, I mean, you know, they have this dream of succeeding, but they just don't know where to start, like baby entrepreneurs. Yeah. What would you recommend them as a first practical advice to do the first step? It's a little well, bit looking back. First of all, you know, um, unfortunately, one of my strengths was not coding. I would <laughs> do coding and then get into uh, into the internet and social media. But um, what I what I will say is again, uh, really analyzing yourself, finding out your strength, mm -hmm. who you are, what is what are you really, what is your personal competitive advantage over mm -hmm. other people. And, and, and to leverage that into a career or mm -hmm. a passion mm -hmm. or whatever you want to pursue. But mm -hmm. it's really understanding yourself. And we don't understand ourselves that well. We don't know ourselves. So, uh, you know, that is that I think is the, I still don't know myself. Mm -hmm. I still don't know all of my trends or all my weaknesses. And I have tons of weaknesses. But, um, you know, I'm still trying to you know, find out things about myself. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not so good at this. I'm a little bit better at this. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you can do that early on, mm -hmm. to understand your own strengths earlier on, mm -hmm. and then have that mindset of trying to see, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes when people start and say, oh, this is a hot business, or this is like doing very well, I want to mm -hmm. do that business. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't, if that doesn't leverage your strength, mm -hmm. you probably won't succeed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I could never do a Google or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm unfortunately hopeless with IT. You know, so that's way outside of my, mm -hmm. my strength and my potential. I wish it was, because mm -hmm. obviously that's a growth industry. So, mm -hmm. I would, you know, you would normally say, oh, you know, let's do that, you know, or, you know, maybe, you know, doing, you know, gaming or, you know, uh, maybe make an, uh, you know, electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. But those are all great businesses that are growing. But if I can't leverage my strengths into that. Mm -hmm. Now, I could say, okay, if there is a great electric vehicle manufacturer that wants to come to Japan and need it, someone to help them with it. Maybe I can leverage my strength mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. But it really, you know, I have to, you have to say what, what are your strengths and mm -hmm. how can you leverage that in a growth industry, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, because the interesting thing was when I, I mentioned earlier I was in the lumber business and medical device mm -hmm. businesses. When I did those things, I did leverage my strength. It was not growth industry. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I did do fairly large volume business, but when I did the Domino's Pizza in the 1980s, mm -hmm. at that time, the restaurant industry itself was growing, and the Japanese backward economy was growing. By the way, mm -hmm. I thought I was doing great, but so, so was everyone else. But, uh, uh, but, then it, but it was a growth industry. Mm -hmm. And then I was leveraging my, my strength of U.S. Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So certainly, understand your strength, and ideally leveraging that in some kind of growth industry. Mm -hmm. If you can combine those two, um, That'll give you some focus as to what you should be looking mm -hmm. at. Yeah. Okay. So, what is? But if it's not a growth industry, mm -hmm. but it is your strength, that's that's the the, the more important element. Yeah. So, um, what would you say that the concept? I mean, you know, you will probably uh, in the future to continue and keep continuing finding these businesses using basically your specialty, which is um, you mentioned. Um, think global, but act local, you say? Yeah. Or adapt yes. local? Yeah, uh, act locally and, well, adapt for the Japanese market, mm -hmm. correct. So, what, how do you actually pick and choose the businesses that you want to expand? Well, so a lot of it, uh, you know, you develop a network, people, mm -hmm. you, as, as you do business, mm -hmm. and, uh, or in general, uh, socialize, and, and you meet interesting people, mm -hmm. and then, uh, if you see it as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. if you see an opportunity there where there's something that uh, would make sense, then, uh, you know, uh, I think networking means a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I belong to various different organizations, mm -hmm. uh, business organizations, global organizations, mm -hmm. actually. And um, through that, I, I, I meet other very, very successful people mm -hmm. doing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And even if I, not 
even if it's not something that I would work with them directly as a business, you know, I might get inspired by them or, you know, given it's kind of a direction as to what I might want to do. So I think that, um, at least for myself, you know, I, I'm inspired by other very successful people. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, you know, sometimes that's where I'll get some ideas mm -hmm. for, from other people who are, who are doing things. You know, I, I, you know, there's no one formula, by mm -hmm. the way. And so um, when you're an entrepreneur, I mean, there, there's no manual to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the whole point you about an entrepreneur. just figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but um, I, I think that uh, certainly developing a strong personal network mm -hmm. in either case is, is helpful no mm -hmm. matter what. Mm -hmm. If you can do that. Now some people, they, that might not be their strength. Okay, then mm -hmm. you find some other way to, to find new businesses. Mm -hmm. In my case, I've been very lucky that I've been able to develop uh, all kinds of various different network, both social and business-wise. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and through that, either directly or indirectly, you know, uh, got ideas for, for new businesses. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, what would you say that is the jiku, uh, like the core of your confidence? Well, so core of the confidence goes back to understand your strengths. And as you, you do get some, you know, success with that, uh, that then leads to... Um, confidence and then you mm -hmm. then you kind of replicate mm -hmm. that it is a learning process mm -hmm. I think um, at least in my case mm -hmm. um, I didn't say okay I'm confident day one you know or knew my strengths because it, mm -hmm. it, it's like going to school you have to learn mm -hmm. even even if it's your strength you have to kind of mm -hmm. it's like working out you know physically you have to kind of enhance it you know mm -hmm. by bodybuilding and so on and and I think that um, confidence comes with some Success and mm -hmm. you get more success, you get more confidence, mm -hmm. and you know, and you, and you of course leverage your strength, and it, and it, it uh, becomes a virtuous uh, cycle that builds on itself. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, um, you know, I think that's my at least view on confidence. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's something that you just you just say, okay, I'm confident, mm -hmm. I can do this thing. I think you need to kind of develop a, a track record to mm -hmm. your confidence. Mm -hmm. That's okay, you know, I, I did do a few things mm -hmm. and. Uh, they worked out and, 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 and it builds. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you say, well, um, you know, it, it, it gives you the comments to, to try to do mm -hmm. other challenges. And, and so I, I, think, I think that's, that's how I view it. Yeah. What would you say your next goal is? Mm. So uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think that. Uh, I still think that there are some interesting challenges out there for me, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, again, leveraging my now not only my strength at U.S. Japan, but some of my track record mm -hmm. of in my businesses, mm -hmm. and of course, some relationships, both business and otherwise, that I've developed over mm -hmm. the years. So again, that they've all become my strength now. Mm -hmm. So your strength changes mm -hmm. as, and evolves, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm trying to see how I can, you know, again, leverage. What I have developed today, mm -hmm. uh, in 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 a in a again in a more value-added way that uh, would be interesting for mm -hmm. me. You know, I don't think I ever want to just kind of sit on a beach and retire. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a home in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually on a golf course. Uh, right. I enjoy it for maybe about the first couple of weeks, and then all of a sudden I feel like I need to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's. You know, I don't, uh, that's kind of how I, I see it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think at the end of the day, what I'd like is, I think it's a matter of balance mm -hmm. yeah, that I would eventually like to have. Mm -hmm. But being an entrepreneur, I think you tend to be unbalanced because mm -hmm. it seems like it's, it's, it's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always believe in the thing about being balanced, but I'm not sure if I'll get there because uh, I think, um, uh, I hope to, but as an entrepreneur, generally, you have to kind of go all in mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's, um, on the other hand, you get a lot of satisfaction if mm -hmm. you, you achieve something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at least I'm still at that stage. Now, you know, maybe next year I, I might feel differently, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel now. What are the three words that you would say are representing your core and direction of life? Three important words for you. Okay, well, that's a very difficult question. I <laughs> never thought about it in three words. But as I mentioned, you know, positive thinking, so mm -hmm. the 
phrase can do, I think, yep. uh, is, is very important. But the other thing I mentioned, brick walls. So, you know, brick never wall. give up. Mm. I think it's also a, a critical word. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the third is, you know, to always have a dream. And, um, you know, without a dream, I mean, you know, uh, it, business is not that exciting. You have mm -hmm. to have, have a dream. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, and then try to achieve it. Mm -hmm. You know, it just can't be a dream either. Mm -hmm. You have to really try to achieve it. So I, I think those would be my three words. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I mean, I don't think that I should even ask you this question because I think we understood it, but I still need to. Okay. Do you feel confident? Ah, uh, you know that's <laughs> okay. I, I don't. I don't. That's a good question. I think I'm still working on it. Really? Yes, and I think, as I said, it's a building process. Okay. I'm still building. Yes, I'm still working on it. I'd say. I like think I pr yeah, I probably have to learn more from you on confidence. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I do think that uh, your answer is extremely entrepreneur, but also at the same time bicultural. I believe mm -hmm. because yes. I think confidence. I mean, it's a very delicate topic in uh, Japan. I think confidence is uh, a word that people don't, you know, what we say, jishin, they don't really want to say that they're confident because it's more about humility in Japan. Well, that's true. Correct. But I think it is important to um, either, even if you don't say it out loud, at least feel and share. But you have to have confidence. If you don't have confidence in yourself, then your customer or whoever you're uh, working with will not have confidence Absolutely. in you. So I, I agree with that. Mm. Um, but, you know, I think I... Um, well, I'm not sure if the word is confident. I think I, I could still do a lot more things to, mm -hmm. to, to maybe achieve more confidence, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and, uh, but certainly, you know, y you need to be confident. Um, uh, otherwise, no one will have confidence in you. Mm -hmm. That that's, that's goes without saying. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that's a subject of your, uh, uh, your theme here. Uh, so certainly, mm -hmm. I have confidence, but I think that there are more things that I can do. Uh, but yeah, you, you need to, um, I mean, you have to believe in yourself, mm -hmm. otherwise no one will believe in you. That, that's basic. Yeah, and, uh, and But then uh, you also have to then develop a track record, mm -hmm. so you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a dynamic, uh, dynamic there, mm -hmm. and uh, achieve something, and mm -hmm. so then people will believe in you as well too. Mm -hmm. and, and, then as it, and then it, get, it, it grows, you know, so uh, I think maybe that was my, my point, but yes, I, I guess I do have confidence. <laughs> Great. <yes. laughs> Um, just to close this uh, uh, interview, too, um, one, one question I actually don't usually ask, but do you believe having these two cultures and coming originally from, from U.S., do you believe that Japan need more confidence to succeed in entrepreneurship? Um, so, uh, well, Maybe let me answer that in a little bit of a different sure. way. Um, you know, if you look at, say, the, the 1950s in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, everyone was, well, they, call, they had a term called the corporate man, mm -hmm. and everyone worked for a company, GM or Ford or IBM, their whole life, mm -hmm. and they, they, don't, they were not entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. actually. So U.S., you'd think of them as very entrepreneurs. In the 1950s, they were not. Mm -hmm. But in the 1960s, they broke the social contract. They were laid off. And so you had the best and brightest people having mm -hmm. fine jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's where entrepreneurship started out. Mm -hmm. But in Japan, uh, you know, there, it was the, the economy was growing from the 60s on up for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So the, safe, the best and brightest, first I went to government from mm -hmm. Todai, you mm -hmm. know, Tokyo University, the government. Then they went to the, the large corporations. Mm -hmm. As I said, and then you know the the, the dregs uh, or the people that didn't succeed became entrepreneurs. So it was not the environment for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. or great human capital, because you need great human capital to be a great entrepreneur. But after 30 years, yeah. you know, first I think 10 years I remember they said it's the worst recession since the war. And so I thought that was bad. Then it was followed by another 20 years of uh, deflation. It was like mm -hmm. the Great Depression <laughs> of the 1930s. It was mm -hmm. likened to that. And then we have Corona on top of this. But anyway, what that has done is that government is not hiring, large mm -hmm. corporates are not hiring. So all of a sudden, you have great human capital mm -hmm. that had to develop businesses. And so you do now have a lot of entrepreneurs. Now, again, there's a shift towards 
uh, people trying to hire mm -hmm. because uh, there's, a, again, a labor shortage. Mm -hmm. But the genie has been let out of the bottle, and entrepreneurship is already catching on mm -hmm. now uh, in, in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I see it more so than, than people realize. Mm -hmm. The problem with entrepreneurship in Japan is that when they do a, uh, a pitch mm -hmm. for, like, say, venture capital mm -hmm. or whatever funding, mm -hmm. their whole goal is to go national, yeah. Hokkaido through Kyushu. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't get the valuation yeah. when you say global. So yeah. the, all the Silicon Valley guys says, I'm going to go global, even though you have no idea what that is, but the valuations change. Yeah. So uh, you could say it's a matter of confidence, or you could say the biggest issue is to have a global mindset. Of course. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and you really want to, and, and really have that mm -hmm. mindset to, to go global, because mm -hmm. that will change the valuation of your company as well as the scope mm -hmm. and, and scale. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that that is perhaps right now one of the um, kind of the areas that the Japanese entrepreneur has to kind of mm -hmm. um, really think about this mm -hmm. global mindset. Mm -hmm. I think entrepreneurship itself, mm -hmm. as I said, is, is finally, you know, it's taking root, mm -hmm. it's growing there, but mm -hmm. their ambition tends to be <laughs> national, not global. And I think that, that has to change. And there's, there's very various reasons, because this is still the third largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. So just they can succeed just, just within Japan. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't get to the scale of, of say, the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley people who say they want to go global. Mm -hmm. And do you believe that the language is also a barrier for them? Of course it is, because everything is in English. If you do your pitch to venture capitalists mm -hmm. in English, and you know, how do you come across, mm -hmm. presentation becomes mm -hmm. a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the Japanese culture is to be humble, mm -hmm. not to brag, not mm -hmm. to say I'm great and I'm going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then that doesn't really resonate with, mm -hmm. with a lot of people mm -hmm. with, by being humble and mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, I'm not sure I can do this. I don't have the confidence. I can't mm -hmm. do that. So on. Uh, it's very hard to sell someone in your company that way. Um, and so is a cultural uh, issue, there's a, a, again, and a, and a language issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 but I'm, I'm an optimist of, on Japan, and I believe that you know, that will change. Mm -hmm. But that is an issue today, yes. That is one of yeah. my goals, indeed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so maybe to close this uh, beautiful interview, mm -hmm. um, if you have any maybe message to our viewers um, towards this camera, if you can maybe boost um, people's motivation into really um, inspiring them to, I would say, the can do, your spirit yeah. that you learned. Well, I think, um, like yourself, you just have to be a, a positive thinker. Yeah. And as I mentioned, uh, can do, mm -hmm. don't give up, <laughs> and have a dream. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ernie. Okay. It was absolutely really very unique. I didn't actually know that you had so many different, um, I would say... Challenges. <laughs> challenges, <laughs> fan, but also um, you really do go into different industries ah, yes. without fear. Yes. Uh, that, uh, that could be a strength or a weakness, but yes. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah. It was really, really uh, exciting. I hope yeah. you enjoyed as well. And uh, did you have did you enjoy? Uh, well, this is a new experience for me. <laughs> I'm all for new experiences, yes. Um, for me, it was very enlightening also because um, I think that we have the opposite side of culture because I was raised yeah. basically born in Paris but raised in Japan. Yes. And uh, you basically got to learn the culture afterwards. But um, Yes, because you're maybe very Japanese but you don't look that way. Sorry. I'm the opposite. I, I <laughs> I looked out, but I'm not, and yeah. so it's, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, but it's, uh, it's, yeah. Very, it's very unique, and uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, one of my goals also on, on this um, COC TV is really to, to bring the notion of confidence that Japanese, I believe every single uh, Japanese do have confidence, but they don't say it out loud, or they don't express it as much as they should to basically go global because they're yes. amazing. I Confidence, mean. but a, a global mindset. Mm -hmm. I think a global mindset is, 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 a, is, a, it is a mindset, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's very critical mm -hmm. uh, uh, going forward in today's, in mm -hmm. today's world. Mm -hmm. Whether you're an entrepreneur or not, mm -hmm. I think that's very important because the globalization is, is a big thing. Uh, whatever you do, it's going to affect you. Mm -hmm. uh, global companies will come to Japan or, or it could be whatever, mm -hmm. uh, cultures, uh, 
you know, global warming, mm -hmm. everything is, has global implications. Mm -hmm. And so you have to know and have that mindset yeah. of, of, you know, of the world and be aware we're no longer, you cannot just be an island nation. Mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. And coming from a person from two culture, which I share also, mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, it was very, very interesting. I did not, I had a lot of, uh, you know, it's always interesting to talk directly instead of just Googling yeah. people's information, I believe. So I hope you enjoyed as well. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. And I uh, hope to learn a lot more and see the next ventures. I don't know which one you will <laughs> challenge next, but I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much.